Okay guys, so I'm going to be going through the exam paper that my year 12s just did for the mock exam um, and it was actually the 2018 AS paper and it's paper one which is pure maths. For my year 12 students you won't have done all of these questions so you'll just need to pick out the ones that were in the exam that we did. So let's get started. Um, to begin with we have a nice easy question, just a simple integration question. So I'm just going to make sure I've got my pen ready to go. So I can just write this out again, but what I'm going to do when I write this out again is I'm going to change this x square root and I'm going to change it so that it's an index form. So I'm going to be integrating 2 thirds x cubed minus 6 square root of x is actually to the power of a half plus 1 with respect to x. So when I integrate this, first of all, the thing you should remember that you'll do is you'll increase the power. And then I say with my group that you multiply by the reciprocal of the power. So you've then got two thirds multiplied by one quarter x to the four. So I've increased the power by one and then multiplied by the reciprocal. And then I'm going to deal with the next bit. When I increase a half by one, I get three over two. And then I'm going to multiply by the reciprocal of three over two, which is two over three. And then when I integrate 1, I just get x, and you also have to have the plus c that you get at the end. Because it wants the answer in simplest form, we just need to make sure that we actually simplify these things here. So this would be 2 over 12, or 1 over 6, x to the power of 4. Then you've got 12 over 3, which is just 4, so that's minus 4x to the 3 over 2, plus x, plus c. If you wanted to, you could write that first term as x over four, x sorry, x to the power of four over six, but it's not necessarily any simpler. Just if you did write that, that would be correct as well. So let's have a look at the mark scheme and see where those marks come from. Okay, so to get first mark, you're trying to integrate one of them by trying to change one of the powers. The second accuracy mark is you get one for just being able to do this first term, so increasing the power and dividing by four. You then get one for increasing the power and dividing by three over two, which is the same as multiplying by two over three. And then you just get the final accuracy mark for it being completely correct, which is exactly what we had there. And you do have to have the plus C there. I wonder if it says that we need to have the plus C. Yep, and it says including the constant of integration seen on one line. So you do need to have that constant of integration. Okay, let's have a look at question two. So for two in question, part one and part two, these are kind of unrelated questions. And there are many, many different ways of answering this one. It says show that x squared minus 8x plus 17 is greater than zero for all real values of x. Well, it's a quadratic and there's lots of different things we can do with quadratics. Probably the first approach that I'm going to go through, I'm just going to go through two of three, is I'm going to go through the approach that is to complete the square. And hopefully when we complete the square, we'll see how we might be able to show that this is true. So I've got x squared minus 8x plus 17. I'm going to complete the square on this. So I'm going to half the value of this. So I get x minus 4 squared. And then I subtract this bit squared here, which is minus 16 plus 17. So when I simplify that, I get x minus 4 squared, and this is plus 1. Now, we just need to do a bit of explanation to show why is this thing that we've got here greater than 0. Well, we need to just explain that x minus 4 squared is always going to be greater than or equal to 0, and maybe a bit of an explanation to say, because when you square any number... it is greater than or equal to zero. So we've got x minus four squared it plus one must therefore be greater than or equal to one because we've added one to both sides. Hence, x minus four squared plus one is greater than zero for all real values. So this is just one of the ways that you could answer this question. This is the completing the square method. You might have done a different kind of method. And the second thing I imagine that you may have done is you may have used the discriminant. So our equation is x squared, sorry, our expression is x squared minus 8x plus 17. And if we want it to always be bigger than zero, well, that means we want the quadratic to always be above the axis, which means it doesn't interact with it at all. So what we would expect to see is that b squared minus 4ac is going to be less than zero. Remember, that's if it's this kind of shape, it means it won't cross. So... Um, we're going to do b squared minus 4ac. So b is equal to 8, so it'll be 8 squared minus 4 times 1 times 17. 
So that's 64 minus, what's that, 68, which is minus 4, which is less than 0. So there's an extra bit you need to say here. So you need to say that because b squared minus 4ac is less than 0 and x squared minus 8x plus 17 is u-shaped, because remember, if the shape of it was that shape and we had the, the discriminant was less than zero, it would all be less than zero. So we're trying to show that this is, um, it's the fact that it's U-shaped. So we get that X squared minus eight X plus 17 is greater than or equal to zero because it's not this graph, it's this one. So you have to mention the shape for this. So I'm just gonna show you that in the mark scheme. So first bit that we got here, um, yep, we've done it with completing the square. So we said this is greater than zero. So when you add one, therefore the whole thing is gonna be greater than zero. That's exactly what we've got. There is a different way of doing this one, as I just said, which is the discriminant. And for the discriminant, it does say you need to say that you get negative here, and you also need to say that the curve is U-shaped, okay? Um, you also could have, if you were looking at this, you could have used the completed square version to find the minimum turning point, that would be able to explain it. Or the third method that you could do is also to do differentiation, but I don't think you really need to do differentiation just for these three marks that we've got here. Okay, part two of the question says, if I add three to a number and square the sum, the result is greater than the square of the original number. State giving a reason if the above statement is always true, sometimes true, or never true. Okay, so for part two of the question, um, there's two different ways you might think about this. You could either just try some different numbers and see what happens, and if you get sometimes true and sometimes not true, then you've been able to very quickly figure out what it should be. Um, however, I prefer to kind of approach this in a bit more of a systematic kind of way. So looking back at what the question just said here, we say if I add three to a number and square the sum, so let's have a think about what that might look like. So if I take a number, I add three to it, and I square the sum, they want to see if this is always greater than the square of the original number. So I want this to be greater than the square of the original number. Well, this looks like an inequality that I could just solve. So I'm gonna do my x squared plus six x plus nine, just expanding those brackets, is greater than x squared. Well, I can take away x squared from both sides, so I get that six x plus nine is greater than zero. I then get six x is greater than minus nine, so x is greater than minus 9 over 6, or x is greater than minus 3 over 2. Well, so what this is actually showing here is that um, if the statement is true, so the statement is true if x is greater than minus 3 over 2, which means that the statement is not true if x is less than minus 3 over 2, hence it is sometimes true. The other way that you might think about doing this question, I'll see if I can just squeeze it in in a different kind of writing, is you actually might like to just try some numbers. So if we try a number that's bigger than 3 over 2, I think the mark scheme suggests just using that x is equal to 5. Well, if we add 5 to, sorry, if we add 3 to that number and then square it, we get 64. And 64 is indeed greater than the original number squared. So it is true. But if we try a different number, let's say we try minus 5 this time, you get minus 5 plus 3 squared. Well, that's minus 2 squared, which is 4. But then you get that 4 is less than 25, so it is not true. So we've just picked two examples that show that it's sometimes true. So the blue method is kind of the algebraic method. The red method is kind of substituting in and trying your own ones. So let's just really quickly compare that to the mark scheme. So they did it a test with minus 5 and with 5. And then they've given some reasons. If you only did it with one of them, then you just get one of the marks. And you've got to do it with both of them to get two of the marks. You do need to say that it is sometimes true for this. Okay, question three. This one won't take long at all. Let's go back to my blue coloured pen. 
So question 3a, it says, given the position vector of a is this, so I always like to start off and actually write it in my column form, so I get 4 and minus 5 here, and that the position vector of b is minus 5 minus 2, find the vector a, b. Well, if you have done your revision, you know that a, b is just b minus a, so that's minus 5 minus 2 minus 4 minus 5, no excuses for doing any of this wrong. Minus 5 minus 4 is minus 9. And minus 2 minus minus 5, that becomes minus 2 plus 5, which is just 3. And that's absolutely fine to just leave your answer in this form here. If you wanted to, you could write it as minus 9i plus 3j. However, this is also correct. 3b just wants you to find the magnitude of ab. Well, you know to do the magnitude, you just Pythagorize these things. That's my made up word. So you get 9 squared plus 3 squared square rooted. I haven't even got my calculator ready. I don't really need that, do I? What's that? 81 and 9 root 90. 3 root 10, is it? Yeah, 3 root 10. So we get that the magnitude of AB is 3 root 10. And it wants it to be as a simplified third, just as we've done. So let's just double check we've got that right. AB is minus 9 plus 3J. Uh, yep, that's what we got and the magnitude is 3 root 10. So you can see really clearly, you just get one mark for actually the method and then an accuracy mark, a method mark, and an accuracy mark. And you'll notice down here, you can use, uh, you can ignore the negative sign as I encourage you to do. It makes things uh, a little bit simpler, I think. Okay, question four. Let's just read what happens here. The line L1 has this equation and the line L2 passes through these two points. Determine, giving full reasons for your answer, whether lines L1 and L2 are parallel, perpendicular, or neither. So we need to make sure that we actually do a full comparison and make a decision between parallel, perpendicular, or neither. Okay, let's start off by looking at L1. We've got 4y minus 3x equals 10, and we need to make it into the form y equals mx plus c. So I'm going to start doing some rearranging. I get 4y equals 3x plus 10. I'm going to divide everything by 4. So y is equal to 3 quarters x plus 10 over 4, which just simplifies to 5 over 2. <coughs> okay. So we can see that the gradient of line 1, which I'm just going to call m1, is 3 quarters. Now, if we have a look at L2, we need to find out what its gradient is. Now, remember, the gradient is the change in the y divided by the change in x. So I'm going to do this one, take away this one. So that is 8 take away minus 1 divided by the change in x. So that's minus 1 minus 5. So that becomes 8 plus 1. So that's 9 over minus 6, which is minus, dividing the top and bottom by 3, minus 3 over 2. So we can see that m1 is not equal to m2, so they are not parallel. Now you should remember, if they are perpendicular, then m1 multiplied by m2 should be equal to minus 1. But our m1 multiplied by m2 is equal to 3 quarters multiplied by minus 3 over 2, which is minus 9 over 8. So they are not perpendicular. The other way that you might be able to do this is you could just say, uh, clearly, this one is not the negative reciprocal of this one. You can also say that in words. You don't have to use this thing that we've got here. You could just say this is not the negative reciprocal of this, so they are not perpendicular. So they are neither. Make sure you answer the question there. They are neither. Let's just have a quick look at the mark scheme. So the answers you get here, you get one for just rearranging to find this, and you find that the gradient is 3 quarters. You get a method for trying to find the gradient of this, an accuracy mark for coming up with minus 3 over 2, and then neither with the suitable reasons. And you can see how some of the reasons here, they are not negative reciprocals, or they're not equal for parallel and stuff like that as well. But I prefer this, this method of saying that they are, when you multiply them, they should be minus 1.
Okay, question five. Um, log questions that we've got here. Now, I um, when I look at these questions, I often find trying to find the students' errors can sometimes be a bit tricky. So what I usually like to do is actually do part B first of all, and that sometimes helps me to find out where the student has gone wrong in part A. So I'm actually going to do part B first of all, and part B is to write out the correct solution to this equation that we've got here. So I have 2 log 2 x minus log 2 and instead of writing the square root of x I'm going to be using my index notation that we've got here and that's equal to 3. Now if you remember with your log laws, the power laws and things, you can pull this power down to the front. So you get 2 log 2x minus, pull that power down, a half log 2x equals 3. Now you've got log 2x and a log 2x, so these are actually um, like terms, you can subtract them. So 2 minus a half is 3 over 2 log 2x, and that's equal to 3. If I multiply by 2 and then divide by 3, I get that log 2x is equal to, so this is 3, multiplying it by 2 and dividing it by 3, so that is just 2, because you get 6 divided by 3, which is 2. And that must mean then that x is equal to, this is saying the power of base 2 that gives you x is 2. So there's my base 2, there's the power that's 2, so x is equal to 4. OK, now let's go and have a look and see what errors this student might have made. They may, have not, they may not have done what we should have done here, or they haven't done because they've got the wrong answer. Right, let's see if we can see what happened here. OK, they've used the subtraction law uh, for logs here. They've done the x, and because they're being subtracted, they've just divided them. But look at this. This one's got a 2 at the front. This one does not have the 2 at the front. And you're not allowed to use the subtraction law for logs unless they both have the same um, coefficient. So we can say that there. We can say um, they incorrectly used the subtraction law. There is no 2 in front of log 2 root x, so they cannot be combined. And I'll show you some other phrases that they might have used in the mark scheme. And then the second reason, let's keep going through. Now we've got to pretend that they've each line, just going to see what mistakes they might have made from one line to the next. So they've done x divided by the square root of x. Yep, that would be the square root of x. If you think of that with indices, you've got 1 minus a half, that's a half. And what did they do here? They took the 2 and they put it inside. So I guess they were thinking here that they had 2 log 2x to the half. And I guess they put that power inside, so they got log 2x, so they put the power in. Uh, that seems like something that's fair to do. And then they've said the log base 2 of x is 3. Oh, well, this is base 2, but they've got a base 3 here. So they've actually written this the wrong way around. So um, they used the, let's use the word that they've got here. They used the definition of a log incorrectly. Um, log 2x equals 3 should give x equals 2 to the power of 3, which is 8, not 3 to the power of 2. So they got that bit the wrong way around. OK, I'm going to do question 6, and then we'll take a little short break. Okay, question six. You may think this is something complicated. You may think that this is something to do with differentiation, but it is literally just quadratics. And it is really, really easy if you actually just stop and think carefully. So a company makes a particular type of children's toy. The annual profit made by the company is modeled by the equation. So I'm just gonna write, remind myself that this is the profit. Profit equals 100 minus 6.25x minus 9 squared. It's a quadratic. You can clearly see this is a quadratic. Where P is the profit measured in thousands of pounds. Okay, that's really, really important. The profit is being measured in thousands of pounds. And X is the selling price of the toy. It is so easy to just skip this and just say, there it is. You've got to read this. 
a sketch of P against X is shown in figure one. So we've got the selling price here and the profit. And it says, using the model, explain why £15 is not a sensible selling price, bearing in mind the selling price is X for the toy. So they're actually saying that the selling price for the toy is X equals 15. So I'm actually going to do at the bottom where I would prefer you to write this out. So if X is equal to 15, then the profit would be 100 minus 6.25 I've substituted in instead of x, I've put in 15, x minus 9 squared. So putting that all in my calculator, that's 100 minus 6.25 multiplied by 6 squared, you get minus 125. Now, you don't want your profit to be a negative. So this is not sensible. So there is a loss. This is not sensible. Um, in a second, I'll go back over the mark scheme for this. I realised I didn't show you the mark scheme. We'll go do those both back to back. Um, so this is not sensible to have this. Then it says, given that the company made an annual profit of more than eight eighty thousand, find according to the model the least possible selling price for the toy. So selling price is X. This is that P, but P is not going to be eighty thousand because remember P is measured in thousands of pounds. So there's eighty of them. So P is 80, selling price is X, and we want it to be more than 80,000. Okay, so for part B of the question, we want the profit to be more than 80,000. And remember, the profit is 100 minus 6.25 X minus 9 squared. We want that to be greater than 80. So it's just solving an inequality. And if you have the class with calculator, you can actually just get a, um, a quadratic once it's rearranged and it will do this for you. So I'm just gonna rearrange a bit. I'm gonna put this to that side and I'm gonna subtract the 80. So I get 20, 6.25 X minus nine squared. I'm gonna divide both sides by 6.25. And so I have 3.2 um, X minus nine squared. So I want X minus nine squared to be less than 3.2. Let's square root both sides. Let's actually just solve this equation. So I've got 3.2 equals x minus 9 squared. So I'm going to, don't expand the brackets here, you're just going to square root both sides and have plus or minus. And then you're going to add 9 to both sides. So you come up with this that we have here. Um, now if you think about what this is saying, we've got an x minus 9 squared being less than a particular value. So for it to be less than a particular value, we've got these two bits that are crossing. So it's going to be this kind of shape, and we want it to be less than a particular value here, so we want it to be in between them, which tells me that the range of values that you can have is that x has got to be in between, that's a point 0.2 there, 9 minus three point square root of three point two and nine plus the uh, the square root of three point two. Let's just see what the question actually wanted. Find according to the model the least possible selling price for the toy. So these are the range of values that will give you a profit of more than eighty thousand. So the cheapest one is this. So let's just find out what this is. Nine minus the square root of three point two. Back to my calculator, and we get. 7.21114. So the cheapest price, because if you sold it for £7.21, that's actually lower than that, so you wouldn't make £80,000. So it wouldn't be £7.21. So the least price is £7.22. Okay? Nearly there. It's only a two mark question for this last bit. The company wishes to maximise its annual profit. Sometimes you see maximise and you think, oh my gosh, it's going to have to be differentiation, but it's a quadratic here, well, like I wrote at the top of the page. So you want to just do this in the easiest way possible. State, according to the model, the maximum possible annual profit. So let's have a quick look at this for a second, because the graph is here. This is what the maximum profit is going to be, and we just need to say, what is that value? Well, clearly... You've got 100 and you're taking away something that you've got here. The biggest thing that this can be is when this thing here is zero. Otherwise, you're taking away from it. So when this whole section here is zero, 
because remember it can never be negative because you're squaring something, you get the maximum profit. So the maximum profit is just going to be 100. So let's go back down here. So for C part I, max value is P equals 100. So profit is 100,000. Remember, you've got to put it back in the context of the question. This occurs when we said that second bit, the x minus 9 squared bit, was 0. Think about this as the turning point. So it occurs when x is equal to 9. So the selling price of the toy that maximizes the annual profit. So selling price is £9. Pounds. Don't need to do any differentiation, it is just a quadratics question. You could have told me what the turning point was of this way back from the beginning of year 12. You would have said this turning point is 9, 100. And that is the answer to that question. So let's just quickly review the mark scheme for question 5 and question 6. So question 5, the two errors, you cannot use the subtraction law without dealing with the two first. That's what we'd said. And they undo the logs incorrectly. It should be this. Um, which is exactly what we did before. And you can see here, this is exactly the same thing that we did. I think we actually did it this kind of way though, didn't we? We arra rearranged it to come up with this kind of bit and come up with x equals four. Question six, the profit, we got minus 125. It's not, sem it's not sensible because the company would make a loss. So you get one for subbing in and one for the comment. And then here you've got the solving of the, the inequality, the quadratic. Um, and again, you can put that on your class quiz and it would actually tell you this. So the minimum price here is £7.22. The maximum profit is 100000 and the selling price is £9. Notice how they can't say P equals 100. You actually have to put it in context of the question. Okay, so I'm going to take a quick break there and then we'll come back in a second.